Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on design and implementation of human computer interfaces. We are currently discussing about a language to express system design particularly when we are following a function oriented design approach. In the previous lecture, we talked about DFD or data flow diagram which can be used as a language to express function oriented system design. We will continue our discussion on DFD plus ERD in lecture number 19. So, both are part of the language that we can use to express function oriented designs. We have already covered in details the various aspects of DFD with examples. Now, we are going to discuss the other component of the language that is ERD. ERD stands for Entity Relationship Diagram in short ER diagram. In DFD, we made use of data stores. So, we have seen notations to represent data stores where we can store various type of data. But so far, in order to represent data stores, we only used a name and identifier, only labels to represent the store as a whole. But these labels that we assign to the data stores do not reveal the internal structure of the data and also how the data are organized in the data store. So, the labels are not very informative in that sense, it only gives us an abstract idea of the presence of stored data, but it does not tell us anything more about the nature, type and organization of that data. It is also possible that there may be relationships between various data elements, which again are not revealed by the labels that are assigned to the data stores. So, many things are hidden when we use simply a label to represent data stores in our DFD, but sometimes it may be useful to learn or to represent the internal structure of the data that we are dealing with. So, that further brainstorming can be done, further optimization can be done before we set out to implement the system. Clearly, the notations that we have covered in DFD do not allow us to represent the nature of the data, the organization of the data, the type of the data or even the relationship between various data elements that are used in a data flow diagram. One way to express the internal structure, organization and relationships that may be present in data stores or across data stores is to use the ER diagram, where the ER stands for entity relationship. So, the entity relationship diagrams or in short the ER diagrams can be used to express the structure, organization, type, nature, relationship of data stores. Now, ER diagram has a long history. It was first proposed by Peter Chen way back in 1976 that was nearly 45 years ago. Now, it includes as the name suggests entity relationship diagram. So, it includes entities and relationships. So, these two are the central concept behind the ER diagrams and ER diagrams can be used to represent relational databases, special type of 
databases which are used to store data and yard diagrams are most suitable to represent relational databases. In fact, yard diagrams can be considered to be another graphical language to represent data. In a similar way, DFD is used to represent the overall design of a system. So, what are the basic components of a typical ER diagram or entity relationship diagram? There are three basic components. One is entity, which is an identifiable object or concept of significance. Generally, it is represented with a rectangle as shown here. Then we have attribute, which is a property of an entity or relationship. So, attribute can be property of an entity or it can be property of even a relationship as well. And generally to represent attribute, we use this elliptical set. And finally, there is relationship. A relationship represents an association between entities. Generally, it is represented with this particular shape as shown in the figure. So, using these three basic concepts entity, relationship and attributes, we can represent or model data items that are used in a system design and represented using graphical notions such as DFD. So, a data store or a database which is used in DFD can be modeled as a collection of entities with relationship among those entities. So, both are used to model the data store or databases that are used as part of the system design, namely a set of entities and the relationship between them. So, let us try to go a little deeper and learn in a little more details the idea of entity. Entity is an object that exists and is distinguishable from other objects. For example, a person can be considered to be an entity, a company can be considered to be an entity, a student can be considered to be an entity, a customer can be considered to be an entity. So, these are some of the examples of what can be considered to be an entity. Generally, entities have attributes or properties. For example, if we consider a person to be an entity, then person can have attributes such as names, addresses or date of birth or age. So, these are attributes that are assigned to the entity. Then we have the notion of entity set. So, this is a set of same type entities that share the same properties. For example, set of all persons constitute an entity set. Whenever we are defining something as an entity in order to model a data store, we have to keep in mind that each entity must be uniquely identifiable. So, we have to ensure that in order to be able to suitably model the data store. Next is the idea of attributes. So, attributes are essentially descriptive properties of entity. If we are defining something as an entity and it has some properties, we call those properties as attributes. Now, attributes are broad generic terms. We can assign values to an attribute. So, that is a particular instance of an attribute. Whenever we are assigning a value to the attribute, that means that is an instance of the attribute. Then we can define a domain 
of values for an attribute which is a set of permitted values for that particular attribute. So, whenever we are defining an attribute for an entity, we can also define if required domain of values that are permitted for that particular attribute. So, there are broadly two types of attributes, one is simple attribute which contains only atomic values and one can be multi valued attributes which can contain several atomic values. Let us consider one example, suppose we have defined an entity to be a student. So, we have defined the student to be an entity. Now, the student has several attributes, one of those attributes is a student ID or identifier. So, here we can store only one atomic value, so this is a single valued attribute. Now, suppose along with the student we are also storing phone numbers. So, that can be another attribute, however, a student can possess multiple phone numbers. So, for each student we might have more than one phone numbers. So, we can store phone number 1, phone number 2 in that way up to the nth phone number. So, the phone number attribute can contain more than one atomic values where each phone number can be considered to be an atomic value. Such an attribute is a multi valued attribute. So, we have two types of attributes, one is single valued, one is multi valued. There can be some null attributes as well. Generally, null attributes are used when an entity does not have a value for an attribute. We can also have derived attributes where the value that is assigned to the attribute are generally derived from other attributes or entities. So, if we are assigning values to some attributes which can be derived from other attributes, then those attribute values are derived values and those attributes are called derived attributes. For example, if we have date of birth to be an attribute as well as age to be another attribute, then age can be derived from date of birth. So, age is a derived attribute. Let us see one more example of these different type of attribute values in an ER diagram. So, this example shows a typical ER diagram. As you can see, we have entity and several attributes. Now, as you can see some of the attributes are single valued like date of birth, like customer ID, some are multi valued like name which can have three atomic values first name, middle name and last name. Similarly, address can be multi valued which can have street city, state and zip code as atomic values, whereas street can itself be a multi valued attribute having street number, street name, apartment number and so on. We can also have derived attribute like age. Now, this attribute value can be derived from date of birth attribute. We can also have null attribute, suppose with a customer we have this attribute of phone number, but for a particular customer we do not have the phone number value with us, then it can be considered to be a null attribute because we are unable to supply value for this particular attribute for a customer. So, we can define an entity and assign different types of attributes to that entity. The third crucial component is relationship between entities. A relationship essentially defines an association between entities. For example, suppose Sam is an entity, E-100 is an entity 
So, SAM is a customer entity, E-100 is an account entity. So, these two are two entities. Now, they are associated with each other with a relationship called depositor. So, this depositor is a relationship. So, SAM is a depositor holding E-100 account. So, we can represent it graphically in this way. So, customer entity is there, account entity is there and there is this relationship between them shown with this particular symbol. Now, here SAM is actually an instantiation of the customer entity E-100 is an instantiation of the account entity, but in the diagram we are representing a generic forms of the entities and relationship. So, we have customer, we have account and we have relationship between them as depositor. depositor. Now, there is this concept of degree of relationship. This is essentially the number of entities who are associated with a particular relationship. This number defines the degree of the relationship. We have binary relationship or degree 2 that means, two entities are associated with that particular relationship. This is the most common form of relationship, but we can also have more than two entities to share a relationship such as a ternary relationship, but this is generally rare. Let us see one example of a ternary relationship. So, we have employee entity, a branch entity and a job entity. Now, employee entity has some attributes like employee ID, name, street address, city address and telephone number. These are some of the attributes defined for the particular entity. Branch entity has attributes like name of the branch, city in which the branch is located, total assets in the branch. The job entity is having attributes like title of the job and level of the job. Now, between these three entities, we can define a relationship works on. So, the employee works on the branch and the employee has this particular job. So, the employee job and branch are related or associated through this works on relationship. Since here three entities are associated with the relationship, so we can say that this relationship has degree 3 or it is a ternary relationship, but generally such type of relationships are rare. Relationships of degree 2 are more common more than that are rare relationships. Now, relationships can be one to one, one to many, many to one and many to many. Let us see with examples what these types mean. So, first is one to one. Example is a customer entity is associated with at most one can be 0 also, loan entity via the borrower relationship. So, if we can form such a relationship then that is one to one relationship. A loan entity is associated with at most one can be 0 also, customer entity via borrower. So, it is graphically shown here. So, we have customer entity, loan entity and borrower relationship defined between them. Now, customer entity has attributes like ID, name, street address, city. Loan entity has attributes like loan number and amount. So, when we are defining this relationship as maximum one, that is a customer can avail maximum one loan or a loan can be associated to maximum one customer. then this particular relationship is one to one. So, we can say that in this case the borrower relationship is a one to one relationship. 
Let us see one example of one to many relationship. We will use the same setting of customer, loan and borrower. So, if we now define a loan entity is associated with at most one customer via borrower, but a customer entity is associated with several including 0 loans via borrower, then that is one to many relationship. So, we can have one customer who can have many loans. If we redefine this relationship in this way, then we can say that borrower is one to many. Then we can have many to one relationship. If we now define a loan entity to be associated with several including 0 customers via borrower, then that is many to one. So, here we should keep in mind that these are hypothetical examples, so it need not be practical. But still just to give you some idea of what these relationships mean, we are redefining the settings. A customer entity is associated with at most one loan via borrower. However, a loan can be associated with several customers. In such a case, it is many to one relationship. And finally, many to many. A customer entity is associated with several loans as well as a loan entity is associated with several customers. So, earlier what we are seeing in case of one to one a customer entity is associated with one loan entity and vice versa. In one to many a customer entity is associated with many loans, but one loan is associated with one customer only. Many to one a customer is associated with one loan, but one loan is associated with many customers. And then finally, we have many to many where several customers can be associated with several loans, one customer can be associated with several loans and a loan entity can be associated with several customers. So, both are possible in that case we can say that the borrower relationship is many to many. Now, we can use some notations to indicate the type of relationship. So, we can use mean max notation where mean indicates each entity is in relationship at least mean times. The max value indicates each entity is in relationship at least max times. So, this is one notation to indicate the type of relationship where we can have one value for mean say 5, then dots, then value for max say 10. So, if we use this type of notation, then the mean value indicates that each entity is in relationship at least mean times and max value indicates that each entity is in relationship at most max times. There can be special cases for this notation when mean can be set to 0. So, this indicates that there need not be any relationship between the two entities and max is represented with star that indicates that there can be arbitrarily many instances of the relationship. Let us see an example. Suppose we are defining the relationship using the particular notation in the example setting that is customer entity, loan entity and borrower relationship. Now, the lines between the entities and relationships we are now labeling with the min max notation. So, as shown here. So, there are two notations on the two lines between customer and borrower the association is indicated by the min max notation 0 and star where min is 0 max is star that means there need not be any relationship there need not be any customer borrower relationship and there can be 
arbitrarily many customer borrower relationships at the most. Between loan and borrower it is 1 1, so mean is 1, max is 1 using the mean max notation. That means a loan can be borrowed at least once or and a loan can be borrowed at most once. So, in both cases the value is same. Now, that is up to us how we define the relationship. If we want to have more flexibility, we can have separate values for min and max. So, this example illustrates the idea of min max notation. So, with that I would like to conclude this topic on ERD. So, one thing to be noted here is that ERD is a very expressive language and there are many more notations, many more conventions followed to represent complex data organization data stores. Here we covered ERD in a very basic way at a very basic level, but you should always keep in mind that ERD is more expressive having a very rich set of notations covering many more aspects of representation of data. Since a full length discussion on ERD will be out of scope for this course, we will refrain from doing so. However, if you are more interested then you can refer to the references. You can find the material in these books fundamentals of software engineering and software engineering a practitioner's approach. So, you may refer to these books for more details on both the topics DFD as well as ERD and how they are used to represent system design. So, with that we have come to the end of the lecture. In this lecture we have covered how we can use DFD and ER diagram to express a system design that we have arrived at following a function oriented approach. So, we learned about several notations for DFD and we have seen examples to better understand the DFD. We have also learned about several notations and major components of ER diagram and we have gone through several examples to understand the basic concepts of ER diagram in more details. I hope you have enjoyed the learning and you understood the concepts that are covered in these lectures. I am looking forward to meet you all in the next lecture. Thank you and goodbye.